Welcome to Daily Office Devotions. I'm Reggie Kidd, and every Monday through Friday, I offer devotional observations on some portion of that day's readings for morning prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. Thanks so much for joining me this Tuesday. It so happens that because of my travel schedule, last week and this week, we are taking a detour in our devotionals. Today's is the seventh of 10 devotionals that treat Paul's last three letters, those to his ministry protégés, Timothy and Titus. Last week in the first three devotionals on the so-called pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, we saw how God overcomes our lack of faith, hope, and love. Following those three meditations are four devotionals in how we show how God implants in us basic ingredients of human flourishing, godliness and temperance, which we treated last Thursday and Friday, and justice and courage, which we treat yesterday and today. Finally, in the last three devotionals of this special series on the pastorals, we will see how Paul inspires us to faith, hope, and love. The word of the day is courage. When commentator Martin de Bellius came upon Titus chapter 2's claim that grace, i.e. Christ, had come to teach us to live with self-control, with justice, and to live in a godly fashion, which in these devotionals we have recast as living according to good religion. He noted with some surprise that these letters are engaging three of the basic virtues of Greek and Roman ethics. The Hellenistic ethical canon included a fourth virtue, courage. And courage is what Paul takes up in 2 Timothy. Either carrying it or on it. According to the Roman historian Plutarch, Spartan mothers sent their sons off to war with a pithy saying, pointing to their son's shields, they'd intone either carrying it or on it. Spartan sayings, 241 F5. Let me give you my amplified version. Son, I'll know you fought bravely if you come home alive carrying your shield. I'll know you fought bravely if you come home dead with your comrades carrying you on your shield. But if you come home alive without your shield, I'll know you turned and ran from battle, dropping that heavy, clumsy thing so it wouldn't slow you down. Don't come home without your shield. Don't come home a coward. Don't shame your mother, either carrying it or on it. Paul to Timothy. At the end of his life, from yet another prison cell, aware that he may be about to take the blade and abandoned by all but Luke, probably here his secretary, Paul writes what we have come to call Second Timothy to his young protege of some 15 years or so back at Ephesus. Despite Timothy's youth, and alas, we simply don't know how young he was, he's been put in charge of what is surely one of the largest of the churches Paul had planted certainly the church he invested the most time in. Of late, Timothy's authority in Ephesus has been challenged by strong local voices. Several years earlier, Paul had warned the elders of Ephesus that not only would they be set upon by fierce wolves from outside that church, but that from among their own selves, there would arise people speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them, Acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 30. And indeed, that appears to be what has happened. Strong and disruptive voices are maintaining that the resurrection has already taken place, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, and that, oddly, marriage is forbidden as well as are certain foods, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Commentator Gordon Fee suggests, and rightly so, I think, but the reason Paul casts 1 Timothy in terms of qualifications for leadership is that these are voices indigenous to the church. This is why Paul warns against setting up neophytes, that's Greek for spiritual rookies, as overseers, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Explicit is the fact that Timothy's youth is being held against him by the opposition, 1 Timothy 4, 12. 
Implicit is the fact that Timothy's locus of power lies outside the community and Paul's laying on of hands. And remember, Timothy is from Lystra. He's an outsider to Ephesus. Thus, this new rival core of leadership has enough local social clout to intimidate Timothy. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to a younger ministry protege who's been knocked off his game. He's playing back on his heels, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And no matter the sport, you start playing on your heels and you're done. Paul's message is precisely that of a Spartan mother to a son she is sending off to battle, either carrying it or on it. Courage, what it isn't. Negatively, Paul tells Timothy, one, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Two, don't be surprised at the opposition. It comes with living in the latter days. Three, don't get sucked into controversies over unimportant matters. Four, don't knuckle under when it comes to important matters. And five, don't overreact and let your own belligerence become just as big a problem as your opponents. For the particulars, read through 2 Timothy chapters 1 and 2. Courage, what it is. Positively, Paul points to three gifts of the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. The Spirit comes with power. We know the power to convince people lies not in ourselves. The Spirit comes with love. We, no less than Spartan warriors, will fight more than anything else because of the mothers and wives and brothers and sisters and children and friends we love. And the Spirit bestows self-control. Courage learns to overcome fear and to measure its responses. Coach, I felt like I was going to die. One night, the Little League team I was coaching needed just three outs to get a win. We had been ahead by a whole bunch of runs, but one of our stronger pitchers had run out of gas. The other team had pulled closer and was within two batters of bringing the tying runner to the plate. The other coaches and I turned to one of our smallest players, Patrick. To all appearances, the least likely of closers, but a kid we knew could throw strikes. And we knew the rest of the team would make plays behind him. As soon as we put Patrick on the mound, his mother came running to the dugout. What do you think you're doing? We said, Patrick's just who we need with the ball right now. Sure enough, he made good enough pitches, and the other kids made good enough plays. Against the last batter, Patrick was breathing so hard, his, his lungs were the size of a blimp. Afterwards, one of our assistant coaches asked him, So, Patrick, how are you feeling out there? Coach, he said, I felt like I was going to die. Courage says, here I am. And I'm going to do my best, even if it feels like I'm going to die. I sure hope my coach knows what he's doing. Anyway, here it goes. Know what? Your coach, with a capital C, your coach does know what he's doing when he gives you the ball. So you just throw it. Be blessed this day.